after d4, d5, c4, knight c6, black is playing the Chagorin. We're looking at the main line in this video, pawn takes, and after queen takes back, obviously here we have double attack on the pawn, so white will have to play either e3 or knight f3. Let's go through knight f3. We've seen something like this in the past. We have to explore all the other variations that are possible here. So as we know, we play e5. This is important because if you missed one of the previous videos where we discussed the main line, several of those videos, knight c3 is coming. And then you're going to have to withdraw the queen and, you know, it's, it's a waste of time. So before knight c3 comes, you need to play e5. This is the crucial move. So when knight c3 comes attacking a queen, you pin the knight. And in the previous videos, we explored all the variations that occurred after bishop d2. Obviously, the knight is no longer pinned, so you have to take it. And then white can take back with the bishop or with the pawn. Go watch those videos that we've, where we, uh, we've explored already, so you understand everything about it. In this video, we're going to go through, obviously, after e5, uh, black just played e5, white plays knight c3, bishop to b4. In this video, we're going to go through all the other options. They are e3, uh, pawn takes in e5, or maybe knight takes in e5, or the opponent not developing, not developing the bishop to d2, but rather just playing a3, attacking the bishop. So let's start with a3, attacking the bishop immediately. Here, you obviously take the knight, pawn takes back, and now queen to a5, attacks this pawn, threatens to win the pawn. And obviously this has to be blocked. Uh, well, you see, if white plays queen to d2 to unpin the pawn, we're going to play e4. So let, let's wait a second, let's start with bishop to d2. So do you understand what's going on here? Bishop to d2 to unpin the pawn, the reason is simple. We're threatening to win this pawn for free. Right? Uh, we threaten th this pawn and the pawn can't take back. The knight will have to take back, but we still have an attack on c3. So after bishop to d2, I'm pinning. Black plays e4 and the knight will have to move. So the knight will have to go back. And what, what if the knight goes to g5, for example? Okay, you play e3. And you're winning a pawn no matter what. So here the pawn cannot take the pawn in e3 because the queen will win the knight. White will have to take the pawn with the bishop, so in order to keep defending this knight. But then you take in c3. Check, and now the queen cannot block because then you will win the rook, so bishop will have to block, and you take the pawn in d4. So even if now white tries the best to develop, you're going to solidify the advantage. Uh, e3 attacking the queen, queen to f6, attacking the knight. Knight is forced back to f3, you develop, bishop to f5, you're up a pawn, and now the bishop, this bishop, that's where bishop can't move anywhere that makes sense. The bishop f5 move is crucial to stop the bishop from going to d3. So after bishop to e2 developing, you castle long. And you're a pawn up with, you know, you're pinning this bishop, you, you, you're, you just have an advantage here. And uh, the, the, the white player didn't manage to transform the, the, the extra pawn into some sort of compensation. Here there's nothing else, because you can't just play queen to b3 instead of bishop e2 with an attack on this weak pawn, simply because the rook will fall. And uh, so, yeah. So in this position, after e4, instead of knight g5, what if white plays c4 with a discovered attack on the queen? This looks more active, but you just play queen h5. And now the knight will have to move. Again, the knight doesn't have anywhere to go except g1. We're going to look at g1 in a minute. Knight to e5, you just you have double attack. So that's just not worth it. Knight to... Yeah, knight to g1. Let's look at it in a second. By doing a recap, obviously. So, take... The, this is the main line. Knight f3, necessary move. e5 is also important. Knight c3, pin the knight. When they attack your bishop straight away, take, take. Queen a5 with an attack on that pawn. Bishop to d2, I'm pinning, you play e4. What if the knight goes to g1? We've seen a similar scenario to in, in the previous patterns, in the previous videos where we went through the main line. You just play e3 here. Bishop takes gives the same result as before. You will win this pawn and then this one. If the pawn takes instead, you play knight f6. And now this bishop will struggle to develop. It will not develop anywhere. Uh, the funny thing is, as we mentioned in one of those, the previous videos, this is a thematic pattern to remember. If white tries g3 with the idea of fianchetto in this bishop, you play queen d5 and that literally stops it from happening. The bishop now can't move. Now you might argue that the white player is still okay after playing knight f3. You know, the knight is moved, the bishop, and then the white player is threatening to simply castle or even play knight h4. The bishop will be in a very good diagonal. But you don't really care about it because you castle now. Bishop g2, it looks like the white player is fully developed. It's not that bad, you know, he's going to castle, the rooks are going to be in an open file. The two bishop, he's got the bishop pair and so on. 
However, you just play bishop f5 now. You don't have to worry about any the discovered attack on the queen because then you can place the bishop in uh, e e4 and trade the bishop. Also take the fianchetto bishop, meaning that this king will be completely unsafe for a very long time. And if black has... This is not like black is completely winning or anything, but white just gives up the advantage by playing this type of uh, opening because now white uh, black plays bishop e4. And the game carries on with uh, white having a problem. If you look at white, there's actually a serious problem. Because this bishop is useless. White cannot push c4 because the pawn is lost. The bishop will have to reroute from there. These two pawns are doubled up and you always are going to have the knight e4 outpost. Any attempt of this knight of ever moving means you're going to take the bishop here. The, the king becomes weaker. So white has less freedom. White cannot really play rook to b1, for example, to attack the pawn in his hand because of the bishop. Our bishop is really strong. So let's try this move. Bishop to e1. The idea is to simply allow the knight to go to d2, and then after the swaps, the, you know, the white player can play e4 or c4, try to conquer more space in the center, which m makes perfect sense if you think about it. However, you just play knight to e5. Thematic move. We've seen something like this in previous scenarios. Knight is threatening to go to the square, c5 from where it will be fantastically placed also our opponent now doesn't get the possibility to play knight d2 because then we will just win the bishop for free so let's look at this option knight to h4 threatening you know to simply activate the pieces the idea is to take back and then knight f4 the knight will be sitting very well knight to c4 comes now and white is paralyzed black has a dominant position and there's no moves that make sense for for our opponent we're threatening to win this pawn and also, queen to b3 isn't really possible because, you know, when you're done taking the pawn in e3, you're still defending the queen. Uh, a move like queen to c1 to stop us from taking the pawn, but then rook f to e8. Putting enough pressure on that piece, on the pawn in e3, and inevitably we're going to go there. You also have knight g4 ideas. Position evaluated minus 2, so it's just very, it's just very weak. And if we take it from the start, obviously the queen I'm pinning doesn't make much difference, so we're not going to see this line. Take, take, knight f3, e5, knight c3, pin the knight, a3 straight away, take, take. Queen a5, what if white blocks with the queen? It doesn't make much difference. I mean, you're going to play a4. And when the knight moves to g5, you don't have to play e3 now because queen takes e3 comes with check, so that's a massive mistake. You play knight f6. And now, obviously, c4 with an attempt of trading queens is stupid because after the trade, the pawn in d4 will fall. So that's not possible. e3 by white makes perfect sense. Now you can play c4, uh, potentially if you want, and also you can develop the light square bishop. This is obviously a massive mistake because you miss the part where the queen wins the knight for free. With white, so that's what's wrong with white's position at the moment. It's kind of, kind of paralyzed. e3 cannot be played. So what about g3 to develop from the fianchetto? This is bad because you're exploiting the fianchetto to make this move. H6, the knight will have to move. The only square is H3 where he can go. And now you can castle. And after fianchettoing, rook E8. Castle by white. And now queen A6. Position evaluated almost minus 2. The reason being that white's development is not really possible. The idea of black is to play knight A5, knight C4 where the knight will be sitting gloriously where it belongs knight to f4 by white the knight is now playing the game look it doesn't look bad for white it looks like normal development but it's not normal the pieces are placed weirdly bishop f5 by black e3 by white only makes sense looks like to make sense at least g5 the knight is forced to go away to e2 and after that happens you play knight a5 with the usual idea of planting the knight in c4 where it will be really strong so any move here for example a4 right just to make an example knight b3 right you're threatening a fork forking the queen and the rook so after rook to b1 instead black plays bishop to e6 the idea is to play bishop to c4 and apply more pressure over this knight forcing our opponent to move the knight but there's nowhere to go with the knight so he's gonna have to play rook e1 and then we can plant the bishop in d3 let's make an example it's, it's white to move so white plays rook e1 right Rook a to d8. This is the best move. There is no move now that makes sense for our opponent. Bishop b2 runs into a fork. 
And uh, obviously it's not an effective fork except the fact that you can take the bishop f from your opponent. If white plays something like queen to b2, for example, right? Then you play bishop to c4. Double attack on the knight means that white bishop cannot go to d2. Let's play a random move, because like, white can't make any move that makes sense. a4 for white, right? Just to make an example. Here you will play rook to d6. The idea of going to b6, obviously. And position is evaluated as if black was up a piece. So let's take this from the start. Okay, main line take. Knight f3, e5. Knight c3, bishop b4. So instead of looking at a3 now, let's briefly mention knight takes pawn or pawn takes pawn before we go to e3, which is which looks like the most reasonable move. But still, if knight takes e5, okay, take the pawn in d4. And now this knight is under attack, so our opponent will have to do something about it. Taking the taking the queen with the queen is a, is a little bit is obviously passive because the knight takes you got a threat in c2 and uh, the opponent will have to respond to that threat. Although then you can play bishop f5. And it's a little bit passive. So here the white player is forced to play king d1 to stop knight c2. So now you play bishop f5 and you are th still threatening the weakness of the square c2. So now. If, if white plays knight to d3 to stop that, uh, you know, the cooperation of the bishop and knight, here you actually just take the knight. And then pawn takes back, you have isolated the opponent pawn. You might now castle. And after a3 attacking the bishop, here our opponent will, will love us to get, take the knight with the bishop and reunite the pawn. But you just play knight b3 attacking the rook. This is now creating a necessity of moving the rook. So rook to b1. Seems to be doing everything for our opponent. However, knight takes bishop. And now taking this bishop means that other, we can take back in d3. Then we also have an attack on d4. Plus we have discovered check idea of going to uh, uh, f2. Besides our opponent will have a double isolated pawn on the b file. So our opponent is now forced to take this knight. Anyway, it's the best move. Rook c1, bishop to c5. Save the bishop. No need to reunite the pawn structure of our opponent. Besides, we have a clear target now, which is the pawn in f2. We want to take it for free. So after f3, stopping that from happening. Obviously, f4 is stupid because bishop uh, can fork the rook and the pawn. So after that move, bishop to e3. After f3, bishop to e3. And it's attacking the rook. The rook will have to move to c2. It doesn't make sense to go behind the pawn. So rook to c2 staying relevant. Maybe the idea of going knight to b5. Putting pressure on this square. Putting pressure on this square. Knight to h6 is the best move by the black player. And after knight to b5 by white. Uh, obviously making this. It's a bit of a silly threat. But everything is actually, is actually fine. Our opponent is opening the file for the rook. You play c6. This is the best move. The knight can't really take the pawn. Because it's protected by the bishop. And uh, now the king going to e2 with the with an attack on our bishop is stupid because he can just play the rook. So after bishop e2 developing, our opponent has lost the right to castle anyway. King b8 wins a piece. You might ask why, how? how? You know you you threaten this knight, yeah, but the knight only has one square to go to. Knight c3. What is it that I'm missing? A knight f5 is what you're missing. The reason is simple. Well, you're not going to win a piece, but you're going to win material. Because now you're threatening knight d4, trapping the rook. Okay, so after b4 by white, the idea is that after knight d4, the rook can move along some of these two squares, maybe. You play bishop to b6, and now you're threatening knight to e3, making a fork. Well, okay, now we can play, white can play rook c1, you might ask, and uh, stay on an open file and save from the, bish from the, from the black pieces. But no, because knight check, and now we win this pawn. And the funny thing is, if king d2, right, knight takes now. So in this position, this idea of rook to g1 might be interesting because when you move the knight, then the rook can go down. Now you might ask, okay, no, there's a bishop attacking that square. You know, the, here in this position, don't even take the rook. You don't even need to take that rook because that the rook takes back and there's some compensation in activity. It's still winning, still completely winning for black. But the best move here is bishop check first. If the king goes on the first rank... Then you can take the rook completely for free. So the king will have to go to c2, allowing the rook to defend the other rook. And now, after you've taken one of the rooks, the funny thing is that you can play... Okay, the bishop takes, rook takes, and you can play knight f4, attacking the bishop, although the bishop is defended. So rook to g7, is there any sort of compensation for our opponent? Well, of course not. You play f5 to save the pawn. 
And now after rook f7 attacking the pawn, you play rook d to f8, looking for trade since you're winning the material. So rook e7 refusing the swap, rook e8. Rook f7, now you got double attack on this bishop. So that means the rook was forced to trade to a winning endgame for black. So let's make a recap and we're going to look at... Uh, and we're going to look at this move. So knight f3, e5, knight c3, bishop b4. We're looking at knight takes once again. So we said we're just going to take the point d4. Uh, after take take, we had an attack on c2. King is forced to go to d1. So bishop f5. What happens if f uh, e4? Okay, change of plans here. Obviously, because the, the knight is no longer pinned. So we can't really take the pawn. So bishop e6. Just going to move the bishop away, and uh, our opponent has compromised the pawn in e4 now. And besides, what matters is also that our opponent has lost the right to castle. So after bishop c4 by white to develop, let's let's look at this idea. How do we how do we play this? Okay, take the bishop, and the knight takes back, and now knight e7 develop. Bishop e3 by white to develop. Our opponent will have to play the rooks in the in c5 uh, c1, maybe the other rook in e1, and play a normal end game if you think about it. Okay, long castle, defend the knight like that and develop. And now we're threatening this cover check, so move like rook to e1, whatever, is met with knight b3 check, you're winning this uh, ma uh, winning material, so obviously that's not possible. And the funny thing is that this cannot be removed. I mean, our opponent can maybe take the knight, then you take back, comes with a check and a fork on this knight. The knight will be forced to go to d2, but then you can increase the pressure on that knight with the, with the rooks, it's a disaster. The king can't move anywhere, he will have to go to maybe e1 or maybe c1. If, if the knight goes to, let's say, d2 to, to stop this nasty uh, discovered checks, now you just play knight e to c6, and position is very comfortable for, for us. Uh, a3 can never be played to attack the bishop because of knight b3 attacking the rook. And then when the rook is done moving, let's say rook to b1, yes, you have double attack on this knight, but white has double defense. Besides, our piece in b4 is still under attack, so we'll have to play bishop a5. We don't have to worry, to worry about the b4, uh, b pawn pushing to b4, because it's blocked. So what to do now? What about knight d5? This seems like an interesting move. Unpins everything. Our opponent is maybe preparing to play knight c4, where the knight will swap with our bishop. But this actually doesn't work, because you will take this one. And after the bishop takes back, f5 is the winning move because when the pawn takes the pawn you will take this knight and pin that bishop is completely game over what if white plays f3 okay take take and now again it looks like our opponent has a knight that is still properly defended but you just play rook h to e8 and now you're basically winning that pawn no matter what uh unless your opponent plays rook e1 but now knight c to d4 and the idea is to be able to kick out the knight with the c6 move. Also, knight d4 stops the king from moving anywhere. The, this rook is completely useless, can't move anywhere without being taken. When you play c6 and the knight moves away, you can take this bishop. The king will have to take back. Then you have discover checks. Let's make an example. You know, Whenever it's your move, c6, knight moves. The most accurate move here is actually knight f3. Because... You're attacking this, you're attacking this, and this cannot be taken with the pawn because then this will end the game. So let's make a recap and we can explore the other scenario, the one where... Uh, okay, take, take, knight f3, e5, knight c3, bishop b4, and now we're looking at knight takes. Okay, as we mentioned, queen takes d4. What if our opponent doesn't take back, but rather takes this knight? This makes sense. This knight has removed the defender of our queen. That means now our queen is under attack. We can't recapture this knight yet. So first you take in c3. Pawn takes back because it's check. Queen takes with check. And now we've won a pawn because we're going to recapture the knight anyway. So how to block this? If our opponent takes... Okay, let's say queen blocks. You just take the knight. e3 by white to develop the other pieces. Knight f6. Rook to b1. Put impression on b7. It looks like our opponent is developing, but knight e4 now simply will do the job. Bishop to b5. What what's happening here? Don't worry about it. Take this, and when the rook takes you back, take the queen. Obviously, bishop takes back, and now b6. We wrap a pawn with no compensation whatsoever. Our rook e5 doesn't do anything. 
We've got this nice majority. We're going to start pushing these pawns as soon as possible. And back in this position, instead of blocking with the queen, what if white blocks with the bishop and says, you know, I'm going to keep developing. Maybe rook c1. Okay, well, queen takes knight in c6. Rook c1 attacking the queen. Queen e6. Attacking a weak pawn. Rook takes c7. It, this looks actually really good for white because it's got a rook on an open file already in the 7th rank. The queen can protect that rook any time. And besides, our king kind of look... Well, our king is fine. You know, knight, knight, knight f6 and then castle, whatever. Our king is fine. But, it's, yeah, it's, a, it's exactly what he played. Knight f6 is the best move. You don't go for this pawn. Never go for an attack before you finish your development. e3 by white. Castle. And now a move like bishop to c4 seems to be making sense. But now queen to e5. And funny enough, the rook is trapped. See how powerful a queen is. If instead of bishop c4, what if bishop e2, right? Okay, now we finally recapture this pawn. And we're going to win because of this passed pawn on the a file. So a move like bishop to c4 now looks good. But you just play queen to b2. And after castling, queen to b6 traps the rook. It's so humiliating. So in this position, what if instead of bishop c4, our opponent just castles and say, you know, for, let's first castle and then maybe play rook c2 and, and play like a decent human being. Okay, well, bishop to e6 comes now. Now, a move like rook takes b, b7, looks like we gave a pawn for nothing, but now rook f to d8, game over. Pinning the bishop and winning a piece. Okay, well, then what if our opponent doesn't fall for this move and doesn't take this pawn like a, like a fool and rather plays bishop c3. Placing the bishop on this nice diagonal, threatening to take the knight, breaking the pawn structure, doubling up and isolating that pawn, and also preventing any attack on the white queen. Okay, knight to d5, attacking these two. The rook will have to move, but now we take the bishop. Okay, the rook will have to take, and now b5, pushing these two pawns to glory. And then we play b4, uh, b4, a5, nothing's going to stop these two pawns. What if the bishop takes? Is this a free pawn? No, because queen a5 makes a fork, attacking these two pieces. What a great game the Chigorin is. Queen to d3 seems to be protecting all of that. But no, because rook a to d8, the queen will have to be removed from that square and we will win material. We will win a piece. What if instead of queen to d3, our opponent plays rook to c5, protecting the bishop and placing the rook on the same file of the queen? Well, then a6. So let's take it from the start. Okay, take, take. We're looking at the main line. Knight f3, e5. Knight c3. Bishop b4. We're looking now at a different thing. We, uh, we went through knight takes or a3. What happens if pawn takes? This is the most annoying variation because it trades everything to an end game. But, you know, white is basically giving up on being white. Because as white, you're supposed to have a lead in development. You're supposed to be one tempo ahead of your opponent. But now by trading this, take king takes, knight g2, e7. We're down a pawn, but we're, we're actually okay. Now here, the knight is... Is uh, pinned. Uh, it's no longer pinned, so it can move, but it shouldn't really. Because let's look at example. Knight b5, going for this, for the attack on uh, c7. It's a bit cheap. You ignore it because you go ahead in developing. Knight takes in c7 with an attack on the rook. Rook d8 check. Every move you make is developing. Every move you, every move you make, every breath you take, uh, whatever. What am I talking about? Bishop to d2, blocking it. Knight to e5. Boom! It's an incredible move. We don't care about this rook. Obviously, because when the when the rook is taken, knight f3, re reducing, removing the defender from our opponent, pawn takes back, whatever, rook takes, check, only move, well, obviously, king e1 runs into big, big trouble. We're going to win the pawn in b2 as well. Rook to c1, I mean, king to c1, rook back to d8, preparing an attack on the knight. However, our opponent seems to have the freedom to save the knight. But in that case, I think you're missing out on what we're really threatening. You see, if the knight tries to go away to c7, but then you play bishop d2 check. If the king goes on the same file as us, then you can play bishop a5 and win the knight. So if the king goes to, well, after this check, if the king goes to b1 or c2, whatever, either way, let's say c2 or b1, okay, bishop f4 comes. The knight only has one square to go to for, for safety, which is a knight to b5. But now the rook can go to the one with check. The king will have to move and we will take the rook. So in this position earlier, just, just a few, just a couple of moves ago, when we gave, uh, when, when we gave a check, bishop d2 check, what if the king goes to c2 in order to avoid the future skewer of the rook? 
Then we still play bishop f4, and the knight moves to the only available square, which is bishop to, uh, which is knight to b5. But now rook to d2 check. And again, moving on c1 here means we have discovered threats. So after the check, you can recapture the knight. Moving to b1 runs into the skewer, so you're gonna play uh, king to b3. But now you play bishop e6 check. King moves to a4. You play a6. The knight will be removed from that square. And when he does, he goes to c3, rook takes him b2, with the threat of bishop to d6, giving checkmate very soon. And even if the, the king had gone somewhere else in this position, from this check, bishop e6 check, if the king had gone to a3, then you will play knight to c6, with the threat of bishop e5. So if white plays this move, a, e3, allowing the, the bishop to come into the game, attacking our bishop, he play bishop to e5, Threatening this move, bishop b2 winning the game. Or uh, now white plays rook b1, or maybe knight c3, doesn't matter, doesn't make a difference. You play a6 anyway. The knight will have to go, let's say, to c3. But now you take this one. Pawn takes back, rook takes. And there we are. Here, just a move ago, when we were threatening this move, the, po uh, the bishop attacking b2, you might say, what if the rook doesn't go to b1 and stays in a1, where it will safeguard the checkmate square a2, what if the knight just goes to c3? Well, okay, bishop check. These two bishops are super strong. The king is forced to go to a4. And now you can capture the pawn in b2 with all the threats of the world. You know, with that in the rook also is able to go to b4. If white plays a3 to stop that. But now you have mate in two. So pawn b5, whatever way white wants to take. Let's say it takes with the knight. But either way, uh, this move, bishop here will end, end the game. Because the knight's attacking these two squares. The, rook, the bishop is protected. So let's look once again at this line because this is important. It's really annoying and it's something that they will often do to, to, to stop you. To stop your plan, basically. To stop what you know very well. You know so many lines of the Chigorin if you've been following this saga. So pin the, bish, uh, pin the knight and now they take this pawn. This is I find this very annoying. Okay, take, take. Okay, knight g e7. And now let's look once again at this idea of knight to b5 attacking our pawn. We ignore it. We give the pawn because now rook d8 check, bishop to d2, and we take this pawn. We completely don't care. Obviously, we don't care if the knight takes us here in e5 either because we got this strong attack. So when the knight takes our rook, we don't care. We take this knight, pawn takes back, rook takes with check, king moves to c1, rook goes back to d8. So the knight can't really be saved. What happens after a3? Normal looking move. Check. If king goes to b1, then bishop f4 stops the knight from moving. We should recapture that knight and win because of better material. And um, yeah, it's a winning endgame. What if the king goes to c2? Same thing. You go bishop f4 and e3 attacking the, the bishop. Bishop f5. Check. Surprisingly, because you can tell that e4 is now happening. However, rook c8 check. And the bishop is attacking this square. The knight is still not going anywhere. This bishop will be safe. We've got the bishop pair. All we need to do is just move this bishop away and carry on with this winning game. So in this position, we just played bishop to b4, pin in the knight, and we're mentioning the variation with pawn takes. So we take the queen, king takes back, knight g2, e7. What happens if white plays e4 instead of knight b5? Bishop to g4, pin the knight. Bishop to e2, I'm pinning it. Castle with check. King to c2. Bishop to c5, threatening a weak pawn. Rook to f1. Obviously, bishop e3 means why, uh, our opponent will have a double, I mean, a triple isolated pawn. Okay, surprisingly, you give up the bishop pair for me, which is crazy. But when you get taken back, the knight to d4 attacks the bishop. So after the check, king b1, okay, take, take, rook to d3, infiltrating and attacking the pawn. f4, stopping us from taking it. Rook h3, going for that, the other pawn. Knight to a4 attacking this bishop is the only move because either we take this pawn, if white moves, then we take the other pawn. Knight to a4 comes at, at least with an attack on our bishop, but now bishop to d4. And we're winning material no matter what. So let's do the last recap so we can close this line forever. Take, take, knight f3, e5, knight c3, pin the knight. Let's look at this move now, e3, the most reasonable looking one although they're all reasonable this one looks like the the most natural in a way that it allows the development of the bishop and the white 
and and the white player doesn't really um, exaggerate with the attack but rather just carries on with normal development e3 is a normal move but this actually is better for black even even more than the other variations because here you take the pawn in d4 straight away and you're going to isolate the pawn this is this, it's inevitable if white takes back the pawn he's isolating it already you play bishop g g4 double attack on this knight would be great to double up and isolate the pawn even more besides after taking and taking we'd also have double attack on this knight so right now you also have an attack on this pawn uh, with our knight so this pawn is a weakness a true weakness so after bishop e3 pr putting more defense over this pawn take and obviously taking with the queen we can take back the pawn takes back double isolated pawn isolated pawn over the here over here much better end game for us so white will have to take with the pawn anyway and, and ruin the pawn structure but at least retain the queens on the board in order not to simplify for us okay knight g to e7 bishop to g2 developing queen to c4 stopping our opponent from castling there is no coming back if white plays back uh, bishop back to f1 to attack the queen that doesn't work obviously because bishop takes pawn takes queen takes with check the queen cannot block because we win the rook so bishop blocks but now queen takes d4 huh? start to recognize the patterns rook to b1 attacking this pawn developing castle saving everything and there's nothing here if bishop to e2 maybe try to castle but you got nothing you can't really castle because then we, i'm winning this bishop and the moment you move this bishop i'm going to exploit the 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 pin and and take it so if white plays let's say this move queen to c2 the idea is to be able to play the, the bishop to c3 and uh, hopefully counter attack although black has no weaknesses it's a fantastic position but now here you know maybe bishop to c3 and uh, at least try to hope for a miracle but you just play queen to f6 and you don't have to worry about anything at all bishop to e2 now to protect this pawn and develop the the bishop but knight to d4 ends the game as you can tell and by the way there are no counter attacks like queen b2 putting pressure on the checkmates quite because now you play knight f3 check when the king moves you you take this bishop with the rook and it's game over when the king moves here you take this bishop with check and then you take the rook it's game over so if white takes the knight then you take back with the queen and you're guarding uh, b7 square so that's a hard no by blank so in this position after queen to c4 earlier we went through bishop to f1 what if our opponent instead just goes on with development with queen b3 and says you know what you got too much of an initiative my dear endgame strategies give me a break okay take take okay castle and now f4 finally this bishop can now play a6 comes now from from uh, black to stop uh, the inf potential influence of the rook and the bishop attacking uh, a7 later on and uh, there's is you know it's, it's impossible to it's say white castles now you just take the point in d4 completely for free if white instead plays rook to d1 it looks like it does protect that pawn but look this is a double isolated pawn here isolated pawn here double isolated pawn here isolated pawn here this is the worst post structure i've ever seen knight f5 comes now and uh, increases the pressure over that pawn and this is now inevitable because if white castles now you will just take the pawn uh, with the with the c knight you will just uh, let's say white castles you just take this this pawn there's no compensation if white instead pushes the pawn to d5 that looks like it makes some sense now you play knight c to e7 and now can our opponent finally castle especially considering that this pawn is protected by the bishop and by the knight our opponent will love us to take this knight so they can take back unite the pawn structure and uh, also our opponent has the bishop pair however you will play knight to h4 and remove the bishop from that square so then after all the trades you can take this pawn finally for free bishop to h1 refusing the trade but now rook to d6 threatening the deadly rook to g6 which wins the game on the spot and the move f5 to stop the rook from going to g6 cannot really be played because you're attacking him multiple times with the knights so what if rook to e1 allowing the king a potential escape later on he will play rook h to d8 finalizing the attack on that pawn and the idea of the black players is simply go back with the knight to f5 and then use this knight to take this pawn so if black were to play again here's the plan it's inevitable anyway knight goes to f5 then the idea is to take this pawn this cannot be taken with the knight because then you will be taking the exchange and 
then the knight will be pinned there are no checks he will play c6 anyway if white takes you with the bishop instead he will take here with rook with impunity and again the knight is still pinned position evaluated minus three for a while so let's move on and let's take it from the start because we're going to look at another type of scenario so uh, take the pawn main line take back knight f3 e5 knight c3 bishop b4 pin in the knight we're looking at e3 okay take the pawn what if what if white doesn't take what if, what if white doesn't take with the pawn isolating his own pawn but rather takes with the queen now here we take the queen with the knight and uh, we expect our opponent to resign that's it that's the end of the video have a good day now i'm kidding so what if our opponent here rather takes with the knight it makes sense instead of taking with the pawn isolating the pawn you can take with the knight but this doesn't change much because you're gonna take it and now when your opponent takes with the pawn he's isolating the pawn if he takes with the queen then take it and then pawn takes back and it's isolated and how do we finalize the pressure on that pawn knight e7 the idea of going knight to c6 okay so let's see development bishop d2 bishop e6 stop d5 from happening it's important bishop d3 from what it looks like it's going to be a normal game castle and we are finalizing the pressure on that a3 attacking the bishop don't take this this knight that's you that's exactly what you shouldn't do is the opposite of what you should do because you want to make sure that this pawn remains isolated so bishop a5 b4 bishop b6 knight to e2 and now here we're going to capitalize on this pawn the most accurate way to continue now if he was our move is knight to c6 so you can take with the knight this is the best way to continue the d5 push can never really happen so let's go back a couple of moves here earlier we went through you know, developing bishop to d2 and then we played a few following moves what if white plays bishop to e3 already supporting the 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 pawn okay bishop to e6 the usual move castle long and now it's defending the pawn even further castle long by black how are we going to capitalize on that pawn considering that it seems to be able to defend itself fairly well there is a there is a bishop there's also potentially a knight now our white player plays a3 which is the best move and it makes perfect sense because it's gonna allow it's gonna allow the the white player to to play well obviously, obviously we don't want to take right so bishop a5 before expanding on the queen side bishop b6 we have attack on the pawn but it's well defended so knight e2 is not even necessary now you don't want to block the development of the pieces so bishop to b5 makes sense if you play knight c6 they're gonna take you so bishop to b5 makes sense develops and also allows the uh, smooth development of the rooks c6 bishop uh, moves away remember that you can attack the the pawn also with the with the knight from f5 and that's what we're gonna do knight f5 now we have triple attack on that pawn it cannot be pushed also because of c6 so what if knight to e2 defending that pawn further how are we gonna capitalize well bishop to c4 and now we're gonna take that knight if the knight moves instead we're going to be taking uh, the, the pawn and go for a crucial pawn advantage rook to e1 defending it knight to h4 is the evil move that wins the game because you take threatening this pawn and you cannot push because knight f3 attacks the rook forces the rook to move and then you win the knight for free so here what to do maybe knight f4 to protect that pawn but it's stupid because you can play g5 the knight will have to move and let's close the line there okay the last thing to mention i forgot to do it is so here still in the main line queen takes back and after knight f3 e5 what if instead of knight c3 our opponent immediately take this pawn i've encountered this move a lot and i need to make a video about it because it's kind of really really annoying because what i have a tendency to do here and what seems to be making sense is to take this knight pawn takes back queen takes back equal material but actually this gives you know well equal chances by both but here you have a better move to play the strongest move is knight d4 two options we're going to look at one of them being e3 and now here you just take the knight so yes it's true that the knight was pinned but uh, this knight the knight in e5 was hanging okay queen takes because the pawn was pinned so these are forced move take take bishop e6 preventing d5 knight c3 castle still preventing d5 this is very important bishop e3 knight f6 castle by white bishop e7 developing the pieces bishop to g5 these are all best moves h6 take take now we're attacking that pawn further the knight has been removed so 
the, the knight is no longer attacking the square d5. So it seems to be possible. And if d5 comes, you cannot take, but you're going to have to do this move. Bishop takes e3. And now, two options. Well, if the pawn takes our bishop, now we still have a bishop. We still have a pawn in f7 hanging, just like the bishop is hanging. However, first you take this pawn. And now the, if the king takes the bishop, you're going to win a rook. So after king to c2, only move, take the rook, king takes back, and now pawn takes back in e6, you're completely winning this endgame. So in this position, after taking c3, what if our opponent recaptures our bishop? Okay, now we can take this pawn. And now we're up a pawn, there's no compensation. We're also going to play rook h to e8. King to b2 maybe to defend the pawn in a2, or maybe a3. But okay, whatever, you just play rook h to e8. This is a much better end game for black, as you can tell. So let's take it from the start. And uh, so main line, take knight f3, e5. What if the pawn gets taken right away? Okay, knight d4, we have an attack on this knight. So what if knight goes to f3? Exploiting the pin. And now, you see, if you, you can't move the knight because then you lose the queen. It looks terrible. How to deal with this? Well, no, just take with check. Pawn takes in f3. Queen takes check. King takes back, bishop f5, developing, bishop c4, castle. Check. And now what to do? If the bishop goes to d2 to block, then simply bishop takes knight wins the game. Because you win a piece. If rook takes back, then bishop e4. And this is a pin that cannot be solved by the white player. Okay, what if white blocks with the with the knight, knight and d2? Okay, knight e7. And now what to do? Rook e1 maybe? Bishop g6, the best move. Rook e2, putting more defense over that piece. Knight to c6. We, we're going to play knight to d4. We're going to play bishop to b4. Not, not, none of this can be stopped. Okay, let's start. Maybe you think that a3 can stop at least bishop b4 from happening. But now knight to d4. Okay, the rook is forced to go to e1. And now bishop to c2 is checkmate. So in this position... After knight to e7, we went to rook e1. No, no, that, that's not ideal. What if the bishop just takes up on f7? You might have noticed that. Okay, it doesn't matter. Knight c6. Rook e1 comes now. Potentially forcing a swap and uh, reducing the initiative. This is important. Knight to d4 comes and we're threatening mate. So rook to e3. Stopping that from happening. King to b8 is the best move for us. And after rook to c3. Remember, this knight can never move. You play bishop to b4. The rook goes to c4, attacking the bishop. You play a5, defending it. a3 attacks the bishop, but now you take this one. Bishop takes back. Knight to b3 ends the game. And here, just a couple of moves ago, what if instead of rook c3 idea, white just plays g4 and says, get, the, get this bishop out of my sight. Okay, bishop g6, surprisingly. Allowing a trade, pawn takes back, but now you're attacking this pawn and it's inevitable to take it. 